Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I welcome you to another episode of our series, The Life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Lessons and Morals. We were discussing in our last episode, the arrival of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Yathrib, or which was later to be called the city of Medina. And we discussed the fact that he had settled in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Now there is one incident that many of the, the, the Muslims uh, think occurred at this point in time. However, it appears that it did not occur at this point in time. And it is the incident where uh, the famous poem, طَلَعَ الْبَدْرُ عَلَيْنَا مِنْ ثَنِيَّاتِ الْوَدَاعِ وَجَبَ الشُّكْرُ عَلَيْنَا مَا دَعَ لِلَّهِ دَعَ This famous poem that we hear, the beautiful poem that we hear recited by so many beautiful singers and beautiful voices all across the Muslim world. Many people assume that this poem was actually sung by uh, the little girls of the Ansar, uh, of the Aws and the Khazraj, when the Prophet sallallahu arrived from Mecca. However, many of the scholars, such as Ibn Qayyim and other scholars uh, of the Seerah and of Hadith, they point out that this cannot be the case. Uh, firstly, the actual poem is actually narrated by a, a weak chain. It has a number of missing links in it. But that is not the main issue, because as we have said over and over again, the Seerah of the Prophet sallallahu is not uh, based only on the authentic isnas like our fiqh and aqidah is. Unless we get something, a religious ruling or a verdict from the Prophet, from the incident, we may take an incident which has a slightly weak chain of narrators, a slightly defective chain. This is a historical anecdote, a historical incident upon which no legal ruling or theological verdict can be extracted. So for the most part, when it comes to the stories of the Sahaba and the, even the life of the Prophet Wasallam, the scholars of Islam are not as strict as when it comes to legal rulings and theological opinions. The main issue is that the poem refers to the thaniyat al wada, and it says that the the full moon has come up from us, has come to us from thaniyat al wada. Thaniyat al wada was a plain; it was a small hill that was located on the exact opposite side from the city of Mecca. The city of Mecca is in a southerly direction from Medina. Thaniyat al wada is on the northern side of the city of Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ did not come from Thaniyat al Wada when he came from Mecca. He came from Quba. He came from the southerly direction. And in our times, if, if you ever get a chance to go to the city of, of Medina, inshaAllah ta'ala, if you go to a very famous road called Shari' Sultana, the beginning of where this Shari' Sultana starts, there is a bridge there in our times. That bridge is the location of Thaniyat al Wada. Thaniyat al Wada, this bridge, is the exact opposite of the road leading to Quba. The Haram is in the middle. One side is the road of Quba, the other side is Sultana and the Thaniyat al Wada. And so, historically speaking, it could not have occurred at this point in time. When did this occur? This occurred, according to Ibn and other scholars, when the Prophet ﷺ came back from Tabuk in the eighth year of the Hijrah. Okay? Also, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is entering Medina for the first time and Iman is still not settled in the entire city of Medina. In other words, not everybody is a Muslim. There are many Muslims and there are many who sympathize with Islam. And there are also still at this point in time, people who are uh, on the religion of their forefathers, the mushrikun. The entire city was not Muslim at this time. So the, the event that little girls are coming out and singing en masse, this doesn't seem very realistic when the Prophet is coming in for the first time. Rather, this incident, if it is authentic, it did not occur when the Prophet entered Medina for the first time, it occurred when he entered Medina after he came back from Tabuk. After he came back from Tabuk, obviously the entire city is, is, is Muslim. The entire city is upon Islam and Iman has settled in their hearts and everybody is you know, practicing Muslim. They want to see the Prophet come back. At this point in time, it is a very novel thing for them. Many of them, as we said, were not even Muslim. The incident does not make sense from the content and also from the reference to Thaniyat al Wada. And by the way, when you come back from Tabuk, the book is in the northerly direction. And Thaniyat al Wada is also in the northerly direction of Medina. And so, when the Prophet came back from Tabuk, he came to the mound of Thaniyat al Wada, and that is when the little girls sang, Tala al Badru alayna min Thaniyat al Wada. Now, we said that the Prophet settled in the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. And Abu Ayyub al Ansari was blessed with a house with two stories. They had two story houses back then. He was blessed with a house with two stories. And he stayed there, according to one report, for seven months. So that's quite a long time, he stayed there for seven months. And in this, uh, in this period, a number of incidents are narrated. Of them, 
when the Prophet ﷺ came, he requested himself that he wished to live in the bottom floor. Because he said, it will be easier for us to come in and out without disturbing you and your wife. Also when guests come to visit, you or your wife will not be disturbed. We will have our own you know, floor here. We will live on the bottom floor. So they took the first floor, the ground floor. And Abu Ayyub and Asadi and his wife went to the upper floor. It is narrated that one night, Abu Ayyub and Asadi was lying uh, in, in his bed. And there was a canister of water next to him. And he turned over and not knowing the canister was there, he knocked it down. And so the entire canister fell down and all the water spread upon the ground. Now of course in those days the ground was made out of mud. And so when the water would come into the ceiling from the top, it would actually drip into the bottom. And so in, they became scared, his wife and him. And immediately they jumped up and they took their only covering. They were only sleeping on one covering. They took that covering and they spent the entire night trying their best to soak that water up so as not one drop of water to fall upon the Prophet ﷺ. Look at how careful they were in their hospitality as the fact that they were the hosts of the Prophet ﷺ. They spent the entire night going. They didn't have any other cloth except the cloth that they were sleeping on. And they took that very cloth and they spent the night trying to make sure that not a single drop fell upon the beloved Prophet ﷺ. It is also narrated in the Sahih of Imam Muslim that the slave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari told us another incident. The slave of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he told us another incident. He said when the Prophet ﷺ came, he stayed in the bottom floor and Abu Ayyub al-Ansari took on the upper floor or the first floor. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, one night, as he was walking and doing his chores inside of his room, whatever he was doing, he immediately became startled. And he looked to his wife and he said, How can we walk with our feet on top of the head of the Prophet ﷺ? Here we are walking on top of the Prophet ﷺ. How disrespectful is that? And so they went to the corner of the room and they stayed there the night. They stayed the entire night in the corners of the room. And the next morning, Abu Ayyub al-Nasari went down and he requested that the Prophet ﷺ move to the upper compartment, the upper chamber, and him and his wife would move down. The Prophet ﷺ did not want to. But Abu Ayyub said, Ya Rasulullah, I swear by Allah, it is not possible that I will be on top of a roof that houses you. I cannot live on I cannot live walking with my feet on top of your, your head wasallam. And so, the Prophet ﷺ, you know, smiled and he accepted the request of Abu Ayyub to move to the upper part of the compartments, even though it was more troublesome for Abu Ayyub and his wife. It was more troublesome for them. But they did not want to walk on top of the head of the Prophet ﷺ. It is also narrated that when Abu Ayyub's wife would cook anything and his slave would cook anything, they would send the entire food down to the Prophet ﷺ, not even touching anything. They would let him take whatever he wanted. And then whenever the food came back, they would eat the leftovers and the remnants of the food of the Prophet wasallam. And Abu Ayyub would ask his slave, he would say, where did the Prophet wasallam eat from? Show me the exact place on the plate. And his, the slave would say he ate from here, from here, from here. Abu Ayyub would follow the exact locations where the Prophet wasallam ate for. Once though, when the plate came back, it was untouched. The, fo the food was untouched. Abu Ayyub asked his slave, what did the Prophet wasallam do? The slave said, the Prophet ﷺ did not eat anything, he did not touch the food. Shocked and very scared, what had occurred? He rushed downstairs and he said, Ya Rasulullah, is everything alright? O Messenger of Allah, why didn't you eat of the food? The Prophet ﷺ said, because it was cooked with garlic, thum. Abu Ayyub said, is garlic haram? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, it's not haram. But I speak with those whom you do not speak. In other words, it has an odor. It has a scent that irritates the angels. And I speak with those whom you do not speak. And so the Prophet ﷺ said that because he had to speak with Jibreel, the angel, and the angels did not like uh, the scent of, 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 of garlic. In fact, even we do not. If there's a strong scent of garlic, a strong scent of, of this type of, of uh, you know, uh, odor coming from the food, even we do not like it that much. And if we smell somebody who has just had uh, a food full of garlic, even to us it is disgusting. And we know in one hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, Adam, that the angels are irritated. This is a very beautiful hadith, interesting hadith. The angels are irritated by the same things that the children of Adam are irritated by. Loud noises, smells and odors that we don't like, 
the Prophet ﷺ said, the angels are exactly the same as us. Okay, so just like, for example, in our times, the scent of smoking. No average human being likes the smell. It's disgusting to him. He smells it and he's, he's taken aback. The angels also cannot like this smell. This is what the Prophet sort of said, that the, the smells and the odors and the sounds that we are irritated by, the angels are also irritated by that. So these are some of the incidents that are narrated when the Prophet ﷺ was living in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. What was the first thing that the Prophet ﷺ did when he got to the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari? What was the first commandment on his mind? Just like when he arrived in Quba, the first commandment on his mind was to build a masjid. The first thing. And so, Right in front of the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, there was a large land, empty, unpopulated. And it belonged to two orphans from the Ansar, by the name of Sahil and Suhail. Two orphans, brothers, Sahil and Suhail, they owned this, they had inherited this large land. And they were from the Ansar, or from the tribe of Banu Najjar. Of course, the Ansar, by the way, the Ansar is the name given to the Aus and the Khazraj, after they had accepted Islam. Okay, so the Aus and the Khazraj were the two tribes, the Arab tribes. When they accepted Islam, they were given the name Ansar. And so everyone who is an Ansari means he is from the tribe of Aus and Khazraj. And the Muhajir or the Muhajirun are the Muslims who immigrated from Mecca. So the Muslims of Medina were then composed of two groups. The Muhajirun, all who had come from Mecca. And the Ansar, those who were in Medina, and the Ansar, of course, were composed of the Aus and the Khazraj. So the Prophet ﷺ asked, who does this land belong to? He was told it belongs to Sahl and Suhail of the Banu Najjar. He called them and he said, how much will you sell this land to me? I want to buy it from you. They were Muslims. They said, Ya Rasulullah, it is a gift to us. It is a gift we're giving to you. It is a gift from us to you. The Prophet ﷺ refused to take it. Their uncle, the one who was in charge of them, came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, we will get its price from Allah, not from you. In other words, we'll get the reward from Allah. But he refused. He refused and he made them state a price that was a reasonable amount for the land and he paid them that price to build the masjid. And this is of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He would not take favors from anybody. This is not a favor that he's doing. he will purchase that land for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody has favors. It's not good to have people having favors over you. You must always live a dignified life, trying to cut yourself off from favors of the people. And so the Prophet ﷺ refused to take a gift of this tribe, of this entire uh, land from the people of, of Banu Najjar, and he purchased it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the land had some wild date palms, not cultivated. These were wild, just growing there. And it also had some graves of the people who had died there in the past, the mushrikun. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered that these wild date palms, they be cut down. And that the graves be dug up and the bodies reburied outside in another location. And he then took the very date palms that had been cut down. The very same date palms and he built the front of the masjid with that wall. Okay, so he built the wall of the front of the masjid using the trunks of these date palms. Likewise, he then used the leaves of these date palms, the same date palms he used to build the roof of the masjid and the side walls were then made from stones that were taken from a local quarry. Okay, so he had the, the people had to bring stones and bricks and rocks and plaster them together to build the side walls. The front walls were built from what? From the date palms. They were chopped down and they were put in front of the qibla and the sides of the masjid were built by the stones that were taken from a local quarry. And so the Prophet ﷺ gathered up all the companions and they, and they all began to build the masjid together. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ himself participated in the physical chores of going to the quarry and taking the stones, these heavy boulders and rocks, and bringing them back to the masjid and putting it in the proper place. And while they are doing this chore, they began to recite lines of poetry, including the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He began to recite with them, and of what they would say, they would say, "Allahumma innahu la khaira illa al khaira al akhira, farham al ansar wa al muhajira." Oh Allah, there is no good other than the good of the hereafter. So have mercy on the ansar and the muhajir. Allahumma innahu la khaira illa khair al akhira, farham al ansar wa al muhajira. Have mercy on the ansar and the muhajirun. And the Prophet as we said, himself would physically carry these heavy rocks and stones and walk back and put the, the stones in place. And this is the sign of a true leader. He doesn't just sit back and give commands while everybody's toiling and everybody's troubling themselves. No, 
The Prophet ﷺ always would participate himself physically, even if it was manual labor. He did not disdain from dirtying his own hands for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not disdain from work, from any type of trouble and effort when it came to earning rewards from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore the Prophet ﷺ cooperated and helped along with all of the other Muslims, all going from a line back and forth. Can you imagine, O oh Muslims, can you imagine when you see the Prophet ﷺ standing in that line, waiting to pick up a boulder and then carrying it back with you? Can anyone feel tired? Can anyone complain? Look at the psychological impact that will have when the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is cooperating with everybody else, just like a normal worker, just like a normal laborer, he is cooperating. What do you think the Muslims are going to feel? Can anybody complain? Can anybody get tired? Can anybody say it's hot, I'm thirsty? When they see the very Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing exactly what they're doing. And that is why when they saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, لَإِنْ قَعَدْنَا وَالنَّبِيُّ يَعْمَلُوا ذَاكَ مِنَّ الْعَمَلُ الْمُضَلِّلُوا If we were to sit down while the Prophet Sallallahu is working, this is something that is very, very misguided from our parts. How can we take a break? How can we rest when the Prophet ﷺ himself is working? It is narrated in some books of, of, uh, of uh, Seerah like Al-Bihaqi's Dala'il that the Prophet ﷺ spent 12 days building the masjid. And it was a very, very large masjid. And this is something we get an idea of even when we go now to the Prophet ﷺ's masjid, you go to the Rawdah. The Rawdah is that special place between the house and the pulpit where the person gives the khutbah, the, delivers the sermon on Friday. The rawdah is that very special place between the house of the Prophet ﷺ and the, the, the mimba. This place, the Prophet ﷺ told us, it is like a garden from paradise. This is half of the masjid. Because the rawdah, I mean the, the, the original masjid was from the mimba on the other side as well. So next time you go to Medina, make it a point, obviously we should go to the rawdah to pray, but also now go at a historical level as well and see for yourself, it's a very large masjid for its time, very large. That from the, the, the grailing that where the Prophet is buried, that was where his house was, all the way to where the, the, the imam or the khatib delivers the sermon, that's a large space. That was only half of the masjid, double that and you get the full masjid. And that entire huge structure must have been, it is huge for our times, if you have a masjid that big in our times. Imagine for that time, it was a very large masjid, but it was also very simple. Very simple. Date palm trees, the, the leaves forming the roof, and the stones forming the sides. It is also narrated that all the companions, including the Prophet would carry one heavy stone at a time. But there was one young lad, strong and brave, Ammar ibn Yasir. The one whose father and mother both had been killed in front of his eyes in Mecca. Ammar ibn Yasir would take two stones, one in each hand, and he would be the only one carrying two stones all the way back to the, the Prophet's masjid. The Prophet wasallam said, he looked at Ammar ibn Yasir and he said, everybody will get a reward, you will get two rewards. Everybody will get reward for this, you will get double their amount. And then he said, the last drink that you will ever drink in your life will be some milk and you will then be destroyed by the erring party or the party that has gone beyond the bounds. This is something he told Ahmad ibn Yasir and many, many years later, almost 40 years later, this prediction came true. He told this and Ahmad ibn Yasir was a youth in the prime of his youth. Ahmad ibn Yasir lived a long life and he became an old man and he was fighting on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib against the troops of Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and in that war and battle he drank some milk and then he went to face the army and he was killed by that army that army is an army of Islam that army is an army under the, the, the guidance of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu a famous companion but between Ali and Muawiyah the Prophet told us that Ali was the one who was more closer to the truth than Muawiyah even though we respect both sides and we love both sides and we say Allah has forgiven what had occurred and we speak only good of them. Yet between the two Ali was more rightly guided. Muawiyah had an opinion radiallahu anhu and he decided to do something which he thought was the best for Islam and the Muslims but it turned out not to be for the best. And of course there were also evil people who instigated the, the war that was not actually intended on both sides. The point being, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa predicted this way before it occurred. Now, the masjid, by the way, it remained like this for many, many years until it was reinforced uh, with bricks in the fourth year of the Hijrah and the roof 
remained as it was throughout the life of the Prophet So the roof remained as it was made out of what? Out of date palm leaves. You can imagine now date palm leaves one on top of the other. What happens when it, will, when it rains? The rain will trickle down through the roof. And this is exactly what would occur in the life of the Prophet When it would rain, the floor would be filled with water. And what was the floor made of? Sand and rocks. Therefore, when it would rain, the entire masjid will become muddy. It is narrated in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ was praying. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrates that it rained so severely that the roof was just pouring down. It was as if there was no roof. It rained so severely. And the Prophet ﷺ came to lead the prayer. And the entire floor is just dirt and mud and water all mixed together. Can you imagine that scenario? Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said that the entire floor was muddy and it came at the time for prayer. The Prophet ﷺ came and he led the prayer and he did sajda, prostration in that water, on that mud, into that sand. And I saw, I swear by Allah, Abu Sa'id is saying, I swear by Allah, I saw when the Prophet ﷺ come up from sajda, the effects of the mud on his forehead and on his nose on his face. This is the face of the Prophet ﷺ. When he fell into sajda for the sake of Allah, he didn't care what was there. He didn't care whether it was mud or water. This is ubudiyya, this is servitude, this is the worship of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ was the best worshipper of Allah. There is no qualms, no hesitation. He lowers his head into that sand, into that mud. Can you imagine what I would have done or you would have done in such a situation? Can you imagine when we're praying on the when we're praying in a place that is slightly muddy, how do we do sajda? We try to find something, we try to do, not so the Prophet ﷺ, the time for prayer has come, his concern is the prayer, his concern is the worship of Allah, his concern is prostrating in front of Allah, he doesn't care what happens to his clothes, he doesn't care what happens to his forehead, this is what makes him the Prophet of Allah. As for us, us spoiled people that we are, we will look around for this cloth, look around for that ground, even subhanAllah on a clean floor, we disdain to pray. We don't want to pray even on a clean floor. Forget the mud, forget the sand, forget the, the grass. On a clean floor, we try to find something to pray on. I'm not saying that we should not uh, you know, pray on the, the sajada or the, 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 the place where we pray. What I am saying, if we don't find a clean uh, cloth to pray on, if we don't find something like this, we should follow the example of the Prophet and be more concerned with the prayer rather than the mat that you're praying on. We're praying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, when the Prophet is building the masjid, another interesting thing is narrated, and that is that he told one of the companions, Talq ibn Ali al Hanafi, not to participate in the carrying of rocks. And he said, You are in charge of cementing the rocks together. Because Talq ibn Ali was well known to make the clay in a good manner, he was well known for this thing, that he knew how to mix the, the water and the mud to make that perfect clay that would fill in the, the, the holes, fill in the gaps, you know, the plaster that we put in our time, they had their own version of it, between the rocks, between the bricks. So, Talq ibn Ali was well known for being, uh, for being able to produce this in a good consistency, a good manner. So he told him to be in charge of that, while the rest of the companions were in charge of carrying the rocks from place to place and building the masjid brick by brick. Notice, this is a very interesting you know, thing here. The Prophet ﷺ is aware of the capabilities of each Sahabi. And he knows that Talq ibn Ali is good, is knowledgeable in building the proper type of plaster. Therefore, he puts him aside and he tells him to do a task and a chore that he is the best person suited for. And this shows us the characteristic of a true leader. In our times, we have a business manager. You all know that what makes a successful manager, just a manager of a company, is that he knows the pros and cons, the weaknesses and strengths of his employees. And he assigns, according to the strengths and weaknesses of each employee, the task that he is best suited for. This is exactly what the process is, is on a much more perfect level. All the companions are doing what anybody can do, carrying stones from one place to another. But he assigns the one who is the best in charge of one aspect, he gives it to him. Similarly, O Muslims, when we're in charge of a project, when we're in charge of something, we should know the strengths and weaknesses of those beneath us. Those who are able to help us out and assign each person the task and the responsibility that they are the most capable of.
And now, a 50-50 offer on Jamada Ajayat Ta. HRE proudly announced a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to own a luxury apartment for just half the price in the holy city of Makkah al Now listen carefully. In-house finance available. Only 5% down payment. Pay only 50% over the construction period. Remaining 50% will be paid through the rental income. Remember, 80% of this project is already sold out. So this is the last chance. Call now. 0845-078-0328. Help the Palestinians sow the seeds of economic recovery. Support Interpal's Plant a Tree in Palestine campaign. Interpal, helping Palestinians in need. The Middle East Business Forum. The ultimate business networking events. Part of MCB's efforts to promote the benefits of a multicultural society and tolerance towards Islam, MCB are offering religious education support to mainstream British schools across the UK. Through the Books for Schools project, MCB